Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Matusi. I am a researcher at Center for the Study of Existential Risk and Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence. And today, if I leave you with one thing, I want to leave you with some ideas about how the global catastrophic risk community should talk about the risk of nuclear war. Uh, and so typically people will talk about strategic stability as sort of a, a measure of stability and security in the nuclear space. I'm gonna give an overview of some geopolitical and technological factors impacting the likelihood of nuclear war. And I'm gonna offer my thoughts on an alternative framing of risk reduction uh, and review a few proposals that have been put forward in that space. What is strategic stability? Uh, it's a hotly debated term and one that is used by governments and scholars alike, um, but often quite ambiguously. I would say in general, it hinges on the idea of some sort of balance or mutual security uh, that reduces the likelihood of nuclear war. Um, and I, I wanna note here that it is indeed a very subjective term. Um, who can say that stability exists? I, th I think later I'll refer you to risk reduction, which is more of an idea that we can reduce the inevitable risks that result from possessing nuclear weapons. Some relevant geopolitical developments. Uh, first of all, a breakdown in nuclear arms control, not just in recent years, but even in the early 2000s with uh, the United States pulling back from the anti-ballistic missile treaty we had more recently a Russian violation of the INF Treaty and the United States withdrew under President Trump. Um, and the Open Skies Treaty was less of a traditional arms control treaty, but it was a very effective confidence building measure and that uh, as well has disintegrated. Uh, secondly, a renewed buildup of nuclear arms, which includes both uh, intent and um, or expressed intent to increase arsenals numerically, but also to develop new types of systems. Um, we've seen both the United States and Russia rolling out plans for um, novel systems uh, and an increase in tensions and competition among great powers, uh, which includes also kind of a bit of a shift in partnerships we've seen Russia and China cooperating increasingly on areas such as defense and energy. Um, and then you saw recently the emergence of a partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States um, for the sharing of technology. And then last but not least, I think it's important to say that there is uh, right now, there are no rules of the road for engagements to, between the United States and China they lack the sort of precedent that the US and Russia have from the Cold War. And so I think um, it's yet to be seen how they will develop common language and um, shared understandings of how they will communicate during crisis situations, which we hope do not arise. And here I just wanna say an, another development that's relevant within the overall international space, even when it comes to non-binding measures is the fact that the UK uh, noted its intent in the 2021 integrated review to expand its nuclear arsenal. I think this is important because the UK was previously viewed by non-nuclear weapon states as a trusted partner for making progress on the nuclear non-proliferation treaties commitment to disarmament. And here I'll just list a few technological developments that are relevant. So um, overall, we can say that there are more ways in which nuclear arsenals can be held at risk. And that includes both, both physical or kinetic means, um, such as maneuverable missiles like hypersonic uh, cruise missiles, and as well as more accurate and destructive conventional weapons. Um, we also have so-called left of launch capabilities, which could include cyber um, and other non-kinetic threats to nuclear command control and communications. There are developments in military artificial intelligence that could be further destabilizing, especially to the extent that AI is included in uh, nuclear decision-making processes. And there is a more congested information environment. 
the impact of some of these changes is to increase feelings of uncertainty and vulnerability. I think it's fair to say that decision-making time uh, will be compressed. Decision-makers will work under increased pressure um, and they have more information to process. Um, as I said, there are more ways for malicious actors to uh, compromise nuclear arsenals and uh, adding to the feeling of insecurity is the fact that leaders at any given time uh, have no way of knowing with certainty that their nuclear arsenals are secure from things such as cyber attacks. And let's turn now to risk reduction, which I think uh, in comparison to strategic stability is a better way for the GCR community to talk about the risk of nuclear war. Uh, importantly, the P5, the permanent five of the UN Security Council came together this year and endorsed a framing of risk reduction. Uh, it was just a statement, so we hope that some concrete, op or concrete actions and confidence building measures will follow. Um, but let's just say that risk is a function of hazards, vulnerabilities, and exposure. And here we're talking about the risk of nuclear weapons use whether that's intentional or not. Um, and so, whereas stability, you know, who can say if stability exists? I think that's a subjective concept. Whereas I think that whether you agree with possessing nuclear weapons or not, you can agree that inevitable risks come from possessing them. Um, and so risk reduction is my preferred framing for approaching the risk of nuclear war. And here are some risk reduction measures that have been proposed in recent years. I wanna draw your attention to these as you think about what this space will look like moving forward in the next few years. Um, you could look beyond US-Russia diplomacy to have a more inclusive dialogue that includes not only just the P5, but perhaps India and Pakistan or other nuclear states to the extent that they're willing. You can convene dialogues, I think particularly as this Carnegie report notes between China and the US to talk about perceived vulnerabilities of nuclear command and control to things like cyber attacks. Uh, you can reconstitute and improve con confidence building measures and transparency measures such as existing hotlines or um, increased measures for uh, resolving disputes. And then finally, uh, there's an opportunity to limit uh, exercises or the testing of new technologies. So overall, I'll just leave you with this. Um, I think arms control for the sake of arms control is not valuable. And this might be a moment to pause and assess and risk reduction offers a way forward in the coming years and a good conceptual frame for the GCR community. And now I would love to take some questions. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Great, cool. Um, any questions from the room uh, immediately? Uh, yeah. If you could just say your name. Hi, I'm Tomo from the Daily Telegraph. Um, is there a single course of action that you would recommend the UK take that it's not currently taking? I can't say that I would pin one down, but uh, reversing the changes indicated in the integrated review would be something that I would personally favor. I know there are others who disagree. Great, uh, any other um, questions from the room? Oh yeah, great, sorry, behind you. <laughs> Hi Kayla, thanks so much for that. It's Jess from Caesar here. Um, I just wanted to hear if you had a view on the interaction between environmental security and nuclear security. There've been some talking recently about how in, moves towards environmental security could be a way to more useful, productive, constructive global narrative discussions on nuclear and whether you'd seen that interaction in your work. Thank you. Mm. I've seen it and I've thought about it and I think it can be a productive comparison as long as we don't conflate uh, what's needed in each individual space for change um, because the nuclear weapon space is controlled by such a small number of actors in reality, whereas I think environmental issues require traction on such a, a broader, more diffuse level. Um, but 
you know, there are activists within the nuclear space, especially pro-abolition types of people who view these as sort of twin threats. Um, and I think these can be productive um, to frame together. Uh, what I would say in closing is probably just that um, we can think about it practically. If we don't make progress on um, curbing emissions, for example, and a nuclear war happens, we're going to be in a much worse space of not only having widespread environmental harm, but the added um, environmental and, and otherwise harms from nuclear war. So I think it's, it's good to be thinking about not just in a vacuum how these would occur, but also a destabilized world in which climate change is not addressed and nuclear war could then be more likely.